Here we go. I hope uh, I sent out last week's uh, message on uh, YouTube. Um, if you're not on the YouTube list, uh, the, uh, your email list, if you want to be on it, if you're having trouble sleeping and you need to listen to one of my messages and you're more than welcome to, uh, I'll send it to you. Just need your email address, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to p- pick it up in verse 9 and we're going to get a running start about what we talked about last week. We're going to do a little uh, quick review and then we'll uh, delve into a couple of my favorite illustrations about the storms of life. We're talking about the storms of life, things that we go through in life and these things that uh, uh, paradoxes that we're talking about also that the, that those who are not born again, those who do not have the spirit of a living God within them. And that's really what it is. When you're born again, you receive the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. He lives in you. Your body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us. And uh, the rest of the, the, the world does not understand that. So let's pick it up in First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Paul the Apostle says, as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Boy, that's uh, awesome. Even John in the book of the Revelation, when he received the, uh, the unveiling of the future, when he sees heaven, when he is transported to heaven and sees heaven, he really can't describe it fully because he can only use a terminology that he sees on earth. And so heaven is going to be awesome. So literally, I have not seen nor ear heard, nor even has it entered into the heart of any man the things which God has prepared for them who love him. Isn't that a great verse? It encourages me. Verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit, capital S, spirit, his Holy Spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. That's what we're talking about. Some of these deep things of God that we go through and we learn through the storms of life. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may know, that we may know and understand things that have been freely given to us by God. Does the Lord want me to use a different verse? Is that that it? Okay, just kidding. Okay, I want to make sure, right? These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual Verse 14, but the natural man, the unregenerate person, the person who does, is not born again by the Spirit of God, uh, that natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. They make absolutely no sense to him, nor can he know them or understand them, for they are spiritually understood. So we're talking about things that uh, the world just really doesn't fully understand. And so we're talking about the storms of life. Last week, we looked at some of the greatest paradoxes in the Bible. And the paradox is something that, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, um, is something that on the, on the surface makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. It, it just it doesn't make any sense to the natural person. Um, it just doesn't. But it's actually true. And so we're looking at verses on the surface to the unbeliever that make absolutely no sense to the rational mind. It makes no sense to the natural mind. It's really something that uh, you look through with the eyes of faith. You know, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God, right? So faith is the foundation of everything we are as believers. And faith is uh, the bedrock of everything we are. It's faith. And faith, literally, you can transpose the word uh, trust. That really is what it is. Faith looks beyond the five senses. It looks beyond our emotions. It actually even looks beyond the reality of the situation we're in. And it looks to God's word. Faith also looks not only to God's word, but I think this is extremely important. It not only looks at God's word, but it looks at the God of the word. When you're going through a storm, you can look at God's word, but you have to know the God of the word. You have to know his character, his nature, who he is. Not only that he's omnipotent, that he's all-powerful, but he's omniscient, he knows all things, and he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at once. So nothing slips by him. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. I love the Bible where it tells us that even before we speak a word, he knows what we're thinking, right? The thoughts, his thoughts, he knows. 
he knows the very hair on our head is numbered. And, and I'm sure some angel up there is, is counting all my hairs and he's got the eraser every day. He's wiping them out, you know. Yesterday he had so many, you know, okay, he lost that many. And he's pretty good at, at math, right? We looked last week at Romans 8.28, the, really the, is the word quintessential uh, verse when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to a paradox. Romans 8.28 says, that we know, and that word is oida, we know through personal life experience or through past experiences, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Don't miss that last part. To those who called according to his purpose, the plan that God has for us. We looked at that a little extensively last week, and it teaches us as believers, as sons and daughters of God, that all things... Even this thing, whatever you're in right now, whatever storm of life you're in right now, even this thing, God will somehow, as a believer now, somehow, some way will work all things together for the good. He does not say that everything we go through is good. Amen, Al? He's not saying that. Obviously, some of the things we go through are not good things on the surface, but God has the ability to take those things, no matter how bone-crushing they are to us, and he can turn them around for his glory and his honor to those who are called according to his purpose because he has a plan for each individual life. My plan, I mean, the, the things that I go through in my life, praise the Lord, aren't some of the things that you go through in your life. And praise the Lord, we're not all Job, amen? Praise the Lord, we're not all Job. But thank the Lord that Job went through what Job went through so that we could be encouraged. Not that, like I say, not that everything we go through is good, but God has a plan for our life, a purpose for everyone. How many, how many of us in the midst of the storm has, has doubted and said in our hearts, how in the world is God, how in the world is God going to bring something, anything good out of this? I have. I have. I've doubted the Lord. I've question the Lord. I've wondered how in the world the Lord's going to bring anything good out of this thing. Believe me, but that's God's promise. And so I've hung or clung on to his promise. We might not see in this life all that God has done, but I believe in the next. We have no idea how many lives that have been uh, uh, been touched by something the Lord allows to go through us. I think of Chris, Terry. Uh, who has gone on to be with the Lord. We prayed for Chris, and he's gone on to his heavenly reward. But how many people Chris touched in the hospital? How, amen. How many people he witnessed to? My mom, when she was in the hospital, her multiple strokes, she had like three or four strokes. And my dad, uh, when he had a broken hip, and I'd be in there, and my mom would be in there witnessing to the nurses, and my dad witnessing to the nurses and the doctors. And, you know, you just couldn't get in there without hearing that. And... <clears throat> I remember one, one nurse came in and said, you know, I walk in this room and she had a little tear in her eye. She says, I walk in this room and, and I feel something different. I feel something different. It's, she says, it's, it's almost like I feel the presence of God. And I said, amen, <laughs> you know, because that's true. That's true because you do feel the presence of God uh, in that. And so we have no idea, you know, how many people that are touched through the things that God allows us to go through. You see, as we look backwards, uh, we often have perfect 2020 vision, don't we, when we look backwards in our life? Uh, but during the storm, it's pretty cloudy. <laughs> it gets pretty foggy. Uh, sometimes it gets pretty dark. But as we look back on what God has allowed us to go through with his help, then we understand his mercy and his grace. I love 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. You don't have to turn there. I'll quote it for you. But it's one of my favorite verses. In 2 Timothy 2, 13, it says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He will not deny himself. Because sometimes I'm faithless. <laughs> sometimes my faith wavers. But the Bible tells me, in there, that verse, he says, if I am faithless, yet he remains faithful, he cannot deny himself. He will deny, not deny his promises. He will not deny his faithfulness, even when we lose faith. What a great God we serve. What an awesome God we serve. In Mark chapter 9, you read the story of a, a man who had a son, and, and he was cast into the fire at times, and the water at times, uh, uh, some type of demon uh, 
was in there and and uh, and so he went to the disciples and he asked the disciples to cast a demon out and they couldn't do it and he came to Jesus and he tells him about the disciples and and Jesus said well if you believe you know all things are possible and I love what he says he says Lord I believe but what help my now my unbelief I believe but there's a part of me <laughs> there's a part of me this is a tough one this is really rough your disciples couldn't do it and, you know, Jesus didn't rebuke him. He didn't say, well, since you don't have enough faith, then forget it. I'm not going to do anything for you. He didn't do that. See, some people believe that nonsense, that if we don't have enough faith, that God's not going to work on our behalf. We have to have a certain amount of faith before God uh, moves, as if it's our, our healing or, or something we're praying for is like a carrot that God holds above us. That's nonsense. That's not the character and nature of who we serve. God understands our weaknesses and our frailties. He loves us just the same. And he answers prayer. We learned in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, uh, that we learned that God gives us the promise that, that anything that God allows into our life has to be filtered through him. Every test in our life, every trial in our life, every storm in our life is filtered as a believer, is filtered through Jesus Christ, and that he will not allow us to be tested or tempted or, or any storm of life to come upon us that we'll not be able to bear under as long as we'll trust in him. If we'll trust in him, we can pass the test. We looked at Job last week, and I want you to understand, and I'm going to reiterate that I said last week that Job was not going through his storm because he had some hidden sin. That's the first thing we often want to do when people are going through difficult times. Um, and that's kind of a, a theology out there, a theology of the faith movement, the health, wealth, and faith movement, that if people are going through <clears throat> something difficult, that uh, uh, they either don't have enough faith or they've got some secret sin in their life or something like that. I can't think of anything more horrible than that. I can't think of anything more horrible than point a finger to somebody that's going through a storm and tell them that they must have some secret sin they have not uh, repented of. My mom went through that. I had to sit down one day and go through the scriptures and tell my mom, hey, listen, mom, you're not going through all these things because you've got some secret sin. She goes, honey, I've told you, I've prayed, I've asked the Lord, I went through everything. She was crying, thinking about, if I'd done something that this has caused me? I said, mom, you might not know until you get to heaven why you've gone through some of these things, but it's not because you have some deep sin in your life, you've repented of that. And it's horrible to think that. You remember... In Job 16, verse 2, you know what he calls the friends that came and pointed the finger at him and told him that they must have some serious hidden sin? He called them miserable comforters. <laughs> they came to comfort him. He goes, miserable comforters are you. Like, I need you like I need a hole in the head. That's the paraphrased version, right? I need you like I need a hole in the head. They were doing pretty good for the first seven days. They kept their mouth shut, which they should have kept their mouth shut. But when people are going through difficult times, we, we can't tell them that, well, that's, that's because of this. In fact, God tells uh, Job, and he tells Satan, actually, in Job chapter 1, verse 8. Remember when, when Satan said, God says, where are you going? Where are you at? He says, well, I've been walking to and fro throughout the whole earth, right? The Bible says that Satan pro, uh, goes about, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking you may devour He's searching out there. He's looking out there. But don't, don't you love current, uh, Chronicles 16.9? It says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is completely trusting in him. Don't you love that verse? The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong and mighty and powerful to those who are perfectly trusting in him, trusting in the Lord. Yeah, Satan can do his to and fro thing, but you remember where he was going to and fro and God says, Satan, where are you, where are you at? What's going on? He says, well, I've been running to and fro. He says, have you considered my good servant, Job? He calls him his servant. God calls Job his servant. And he says in verse eight that Job was blameless and he was upright, and he avoided evil. Yeah, all those things God called him. So don't tell people necessarily they're going through some sinful thing because that's what Job's lousy comforters said. We need to never judge somebody like that. We also learn from Job that at the end of his trial, at the end of his test, at the end of his personal storm, in the last chapter, remember when God was silent for the first 38 chapters in the book of Job, he was silent, didn't say anything. And Job had all his questions, and who wouldn't, amen? I don't, 
chide Job. I've had all my own questions when I went through the storms of life, and so do you. But for 38 chapters, God doesn't say anything, but he basically tells Job, he says, Job, come here, sit over here, sit over here, Let, let's talk about it. Hey, if you're so smart, if you're going to question me, where were you when I made this, and when I did this, and when I did that, when I did this, where were you? And for these chapters, he goes on and asks Job these questions, and Job in the last chapter, remember, he said, I put my hand in my mouth. I've spoken about things too wonderful for me to understand. Job didn't understand what was going on. Job wasn't there when the conversation in heaven was going on. He wasn't there. But he said, before I knew thee by the hearing of my ear, but now my eye sees you. You see, Job knew God on a completely and totally different level when he went through the storm. And when God turned around all his cursings for his blessings, boy, Job learned a lot. And we learned a lot from Job. We learned in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, that sometimes we get off track and we go to what I call God's woodshed, right? How many have been to God's woodshed? I've been there. Oh, boy. I got my name right over the woodshed door, it seems, sometimes. But you know what? It's great because as you read this passage of Scripture, you understand that it clearly tells us that he chastens everyone that he loves. It's not because we go to the woodshed because he doesn't love us. It's just the opposite. It's because he loves us. It's because he, you're off track here. So come on, come on, come on. You have to do that to your kids, don't you? And it's not because you don't love your children. It's because you do love them. Train up a child in a way he should go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. That training, that discipline that we have. So we thank the Lord that God uses these things. But clearly that passage tells us that it's because of his love that he does these things. And we are chastened of him. We also learn from James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 and verse 12 that another paradox of paradoxes, we're to count it all joy when we fall into all kinds of different trials and tribulations. What in the world is that? That doesn't make any sense, again, to the natural mind. How in the world can I count it all joy when I fall into these trials and testings and things like that? Unless you understand the purpose that James tells us about, Why is God allowing these things in our life? He goes on in verses 2 through 4 to tell he's trying to mature us, trying to give us patience. The thing that I absolutely hate. God, I hate patience. (laughs) He's taught me a lot of patience through this thing. A lot of patience. I've tried to be patient. Sometimes not so much, but uh, I try to be patient. But unless you understand these things, again, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, Neither can he know them or understand them, for they're spiritually understood. The the world can't understand how we can rejoice in difficulty. But there's absolutely no way, again, you can understand this or be joyful unless you understand that God has a plan. And that plan might not come into view right away. That plan to mold us and shape us into the man or woman of God God has called us to be. Verse 12 goes on in James chapter 1 and tells us that that when we, blessed is a man who endures temptation or testing or trials, for when we will receive a crown of life. It is going to be worth it all when we see Jesus. It's worth it all when we see Jesus. I always tell people when they ask me, you know, what about tithing? What about giving to the Lord? What about this? What about this? And I tell you, well, I can tell you, I'm not going to tell you what to give and how to give. Uh, I, I want you to understand that everything you have, everything, your time, talent, your treasure, everything belongs to God. It's all his. Well, I, I, you know, I, work, I earn a good salary, and I do this, and I do that. I said, there's a lot of eyes in there. And remember, remember, it's only by the grace of God that he gives you the strength to get up every day and do what you do. It's only by the grace of God that gives you the talent to do what you do and put you in a place where you're at. So be careful when you say, I, I, I. But when it comes to that, I tell you, I tell people, I say, you know what? No one no one's going to stand before the Lord one day and say, man, I wish I wouldn't have given the Lord so much. I wish I wouldn't have given so much of my time, my talent. I wish I wouldn't have given so much of my treasure. I wish I wouldn't have sacrificed so much for the kingdom of God. I wish I wouldn't have witnessed so much. That's for sure. Why well, wish I? Of course not. Absolutely not. We're going to say, oh boy. I wonder when I look at Revelation, Mary, you remember when it says that he's going to wipe the tears away? Some people say that uh, uh, he wipes the tears away for people that are not in heaven, you know, that we're going to have these tears. Well, I don't know. 
I don't know about that, but I do believe the one thing. I believe the Lord's going to pull down that big screen and he's going to say, Mark, this is your life. This is what it could have been. And that was what I planned for you if you would have surrendered more to me. This is your life. And we're going to look at that life and we're going to have tears in our eyes realizing what more we could have done for the Lord if we would only surrendered more, given more of our time, talent, and treasure. But you know what? Praise the Lord. He's going to wipe those tears away. Embraces and say, I still love you. Come on. <laughs> Just like a good father, right? Amen. It's going to be gone. It's going to be in the past. He's not going to hold that over us. We're not throughout for for eternity. Feel guilty. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. No guilt. No shame. Praise the Lord. But we're going to have crowns for our faithful service. We learn in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that Paul was allowed to go through a severe test, a severe trial that God used to keep him humble. Remember in that first chapter, it said, I knew a man about 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, such a one caught up into a third heaven. And he saw things that are unlawful for a man to even utter. Paul saw heaven. Paul, I believe, maybe it was at, when he was stoned at Lister, I don't know, but he saw these tremendous visions, and, and he has this thorn in the flesh, he says. And now, this whole passage, when we read last week, was Paul looking backward, remember? He was looking backward on this trial, this thorn in the flesh, which I told you in the Greek is a tent stake. It's not a, it's not a little thorn, it's a tent stake, it's something really bad. But he uses an interesting word. He says, because of the abundance of revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. That's a very important phrase there. The word there given to me in the Greek means a gracious gift from God. Pardon me? A gracious gift from God, a tent stake in my life? Because Paul then went on to say, he said, I, I begged the Lord three times to take this away from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for in your weakness am I made strong. So Paul says, no, gladly now, therefore, now gladly, therefore, will I glory in my weaknesses, in my infirmities, in my struggles, because when I'm weak, that's when I'm at my strongest. See, sometimes in our weakest point in our spiritual life, when we're climbing, we're, we're using the word, a Greek word, globbing onto God. How's that? We're globbing onto God, right? We're, we're clinging to God with all our might. That's when we are the strongest. Paul looks back and sees those things. We looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, where it tells us there that we learned that the comfort and encouragement that we receive from the Holy Spirit when we go through these storms and that God uses in our life so that we're able to encourage and strengthen and comfort others in their trials. I use the illustration that after my accident, after the fatal accident that I was in that killed a man who had two small children, then uh, it was months and months and months later that I had been praying for these people up at the altar at our church, and, and uh, a young woman came to me. And uh, for those who weren't here, didn't hear that, uh, she came up and she had tears in her eyes for her husband. And they were weeping. And I said, what can I pray for you for? And she said, you, you wouldn't possibly understand. There's no way you could possibly understand. And I said, well, okay, but uh, it would help me if I knew a little bit about it so I could pray more specifically. She said, I was driving down the road the other day, and, and she said, the sun was in my eyes, and I couldn't see. And I ran right through a red light, and I T-boned a car, and I killed a little baby. I killed a little baby, and I just cannot get over it. And I remembered how I felt and all the emotions I felt. And, and I told her about my experience, and I told her what I had went through. And I told her about how the Lord had guided and directed me. And I took her to some verses. We, we went into another room, and we talked, and we wept together. We prayed together. We rejoiced together. And she said, I, no one, no one so far has been able to understand what I've been through. And I said, well, I understand and she says, I believe the Lord sent you to me. And maybe the Lord allowed me to go through what I went through just for her. I don't know. I don't know. No, I've learned a lot more through that. But God was faithful in the verses that the Lord gave me, had gave to her. You see, there's no way I could have received the word that the Lord gave me and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you when you fall eight feet from the ladder and you crush your heel and you break your ankle and you're foot swells up like that in a football like, like that. There's no way. There's no way that when he says, praise me in this thing, could I praise the Lord unless I had been through some other storms in my life before. 
And as Romans 8, 28 says, I knew, oida, I knew through personal life experience that God had been and will be faithful. God had been faithful before in the storms that I've been through before, and I know he's going to be faithful now. And he will use this in my life to, number one, mature me, and number two, b- build my foundation of faith, and number three, to bless others that are in the midst of the storm. Turn with me to Mark chapter 4, because if you know me, there's no way I can talk about the storms of life without talking about Mark chapter 4, huh? And we always, we're going to go to two of my favorite passages of Scripture here, two illustrations of the storms of life today. Mark chapter 4, and we're going to go to Acts chapter 27 later. But in the midst of these storms and trials, we must turn to and rely upon God's eternal, unchanging word. God's eternal, unchanging word. And again, when you go through the storms of life, not only do you want to focus on his word, but you also have to focus on his character, who he is. Because Satan is telling you that he's not a good God. Satan is telling you that you screwed up and he don't love you anymore. Satan is telling you because you're, you're, you're still struggling with this besetting sin and that's why you're going through all this because God's mad at you. He doesn't love you anymore. You can hear it. I've heard it. Have you not heard it? I've heard it. All the doubt and all the fear comes in like a wave after wave after wave. <laughs> we have to turn to God's word and say, no, God's a good God. And God loves me and I know that I might be in the woodshed a little bit. That's okay. But it's only because he loves me that I'm there. Mark chapter 4. We're going to pick it up at, uh, it looks like Jesus had been ministering all day long to the multitudes. And we're going to pick it up in verse 33. And so verse 33 of Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, verse 33. And with many such parables, he, speaking of Jesus, spoke the word to them as they were able to bear it. But without a parable, he, Jesus, did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. The disciples didn't get it either, but he explained some of the parables to them. Verse 35, on the same day when evening had come, Jesus, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat and as he was, and the other little boats were also with him. Verse 37 said, a great windstorm arose and the the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling up. And he was in the stern, Jesus was in the stern of the boat asleep on a pillow And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we perish? And he arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why why are you so fearful? How is it that you don't have faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? What a great passage of scripture there. We see in verse 37 that obviously this was a serious storm and the boat was getting beat up and filled with water. Actually, in the original language there, it's a a word that's uh, used by one of the Greek scholars that I uh, turned to for commentary. And he said it was an unnatural storm. It was uh, uh, it was the the word uh, is indicative of a supernatural storm. It was something that came out of nowhere, but it had a veracity uh, that it was a spiritual thing. It was Satan, really. Satan brought this storm up. Satan wanted to capsize that whole boat. He wanted to capsize and drown Jesus and and all the disciples. How silly is he? (laughs) Because Jesus had not yet accomplished everything. But after wind after wind, wave beat against that boat. And you can see that the Bible says that the boat was filling. And I can see him bailing out water. And as soon as they're bailing out water, the waves are coming in. And they are just beside themselves. They were full of fear. And where's Jesus, the Bible says? Where's Jesus? He's in the back of the boat. He's been ministering all day. He's tired. That's human, the human side of him, the God-man, as Philippians chapter 2 tells us, all God and all man, jointly joint together as one. He's on a pillow. He's sleeping at the back of the boat. Now, you can see these disciples. Come on. You put yourself in their place. The wind's beating like crazy. The storm looks like it's going to overturn the ship. And, and Jesus, what is he doing? He's at the back of the boat. Oh, how many of us, including me, just like disciples, have said in the midst of our storm, when it seems like Jesus is sleeping, when it seems like Jesus is sleeping in the midst of our storm, like he doesn't care, like he's on vacation, like he doesn't know what's going on in our lives, and some of us say when we need him most, teacher, 
don't you care that we perish? Jesus, don't you know, don't you understand what I'm going through here? Sometimes we think he's sleeping, but he's not. Teacher, why didn't he say Lord? That's interesting, I think. Teacher, not Lord. They have seen the miracles previously. In the previous chapter, they found an, uh, one had an unclean spirit, um, casting out demons, and even these demons had cried out that, that he was the son of God. And so he had seen these tremendous miracles, and yet they were in the midst of a storm. And it's, it's very difficult. It's, it's often not easy to understand who God is. And it's easy to forget who Jesus is in the midst of your storm. Amen? It's easy to forget who God is in the midst of your storm. Verse 39 tells us, it says, And he arose, and he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. It's a great calm. Peace. All he said was peace. Be still. Can you see that? Can you see him standing up in this wind? The boat is rocked, and the wind are coming. All he says is peace. Be still. You know, Al, sometimes in the storms of life that I go through, sometimes God speaks to my storm and the storm is just calm. It goes away. And other times he speaks to me personally and the waves keep coming and the wind keep coming and my boat's still filling up with water, but all of a sudden I'm full of peace and I got calm in the midst of the storms of life. So sometimes he calms the sea and sometimes he calms me. You know what I mean? speaks peace to my soul. But in all our storms, Jesus asks us all the same question in verse 40. And it's the question. In verse 40, he asks them the question, and he asks us the same question. And he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? Wow. How many times have the Lord, in the midst of your storm, kind of tapped you on your shoulder and said, "Uh, you don't trust me? You don't trust me? And I do the Ralph Cramden, hamina, 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 right? Well, Lord, yeah, I trust you, but. I always have a but in there someplace, right? I trust you, but. Just like Lord, but. And Ananias in, in Acts chapter 9, remember when, <laughs> when, when God tells, speaks to Ananias and tells him to go, go find Saul, you know, after he had, on the road to Damascus, after Saul had persecuted and put people in jail and consented unto their death and things like that. And, and so God says to Ananias, hey, go, go look up Saul. He says, but Lord, <laughs> right? But Lord, don't you... Have haven't you heard? Don't you know that it, what, this, this guy is persecuting you? Don't you know that? Yeah. Sometimes we say, but Lord. He says, why are you so fearful? Don't you have any faith? Don't you trust in me? What Jesus is saying to us in the midst of my storm, he says, am I not trustworthy? That's the question of the ages. Am I or am I not trustworthy? Am I worthy of your trust? Am I worthy of your faith? Am I worthy of you putting every ounce of trust in me? And you look at him and who he is, and you say, of course, Lord. Of course, Lord, you're worthy. Of course, you're worthy of all my faith. But help my now my unbelief, Jackie. Help my now my unbelief. Help me about that, that little part of my Christian life that I'm struggling with because I don't have perfect faith. But Jesus said, if I had the faith of the grain of mustard seed, a tiny little thing, tiny little thing, that's all I need. So, Lord, help me. You see, the disciples had to learn something, and so they were allowed to encounter the storm. What did the disciples have to learn? They had to learn that he was more than a teacher. In verse 40, 41, they said, And they feared exceedingly, and they said one to another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? You see, they thought that he was just a teacher. And, you know, people in the Old Testament, the prophets, they came and they did mighty miracles and signs and wonders and things like that. But Jesus was God. He wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't just a prophet of of God. He was God in the flesh. They learned that Jesus was in control of everything because he is God. They also learned and should have learned that Jesus already told them that they were going to the other side. And many times we miss this in verse 35. Look at in verse 35 at the beginning of the story. It says, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, as they were getting in the boat, he said, let's cross over to the other side. There's in that verse right there, there's also a command. We're going to go. Get in the boat. We're going to the other side. He didn't say there weren't going to be storms on the way. 
He said, we're going to go to the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, God says he's going to take us to the other side. He's going to take us to glory. He's going to do exceedingly abundant above all that we think or ask. But he doesn't say there, there's not going to be storms along the way. But we're going to go to the other side because they needed to believe him. Because that's why Jesus could rest in the back of the boat. Why? Because he knew they were going to the other side. He could rest. He could rest. And so can we. We can understand that there will be storms sometimes. But even if there are storms, as long as you know that Jesus is in your boat, that's the most important thing. As long as you have a born-again experience, as long as you know that Jesus Christ is in your heart and your life, as long as he's in your boat, okay, the wind can roar and the waves can beat, but as long as Jesus is in your boat and you look around and you say, does he look worried? He don't look worried. Then I don't need to worry either. Although my humanness comes out sometimes, but I said, Lord Jesus, remind me, you're in my boat and you don't look worried because you are in control because you are God And you'll either speak calmness to the storm or you'll speak calmness to my spirit, but you'll be with me. Turn with me to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. Paul the Apostle here is on his way to Rome. And Paul the Apostle, now even the great apostle looks like he had to learn or or at least be reminded of who God was in the midst of the storm. And it's hard for us to understand that the the great apostle Paul, with all his writings under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, would have to be tested like this. You know, one of the many things in the Bible encouraged me, but you you got in Hebrews chapter 11 what's called the heroes of the faith, right? If you read the book of Hebrews chapter 11, they've got all the heroes of the faith uh, from the beginning and stuff like that. And one of the greatest heroes of the faith is Abraham, right? Abraham, and uh, in Romans chapter 4, Paul the Apostle uses him as the analogy and basically calls him the father of our faith. And that goes back to Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, that, that Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. But it's interesting to me and encouraging to me that as you look at the life of Abraham, the father of our faith, Daniel, you look at him in chapter 11 of Genesis when he comes out of the Ur, the Chaldees, out of a pagan background, and he comes to chapter 12 all the way to 22, and you know what? He had a faith walk, and it was like this, wasn't it, Al? He wasn't always faithful. He made some mistakes. He made some blunders. He's got some blunders in there that we're still paying for and the Jews are paying for today. When he allowed uh, his wife to talk him into having relations with Hagar, remember God told him he was going to give him a son. And she was real old and he was real old and they started doubting God. And so they started trying to help God out. Has anybody ever tried to help God out in a situation? Oh yeah, how'd that work out for you? Never works out good for me. I don't know if it works out for you. Never works out good for me because I got a plan. It's often not God's plan. And so he allows, he listens to his wife and he goes into Hagar and she conceives and he has a, a, a young boy named Ishmael. Ishmael is the father of the Arab nations today. All the Arab nations that have uh, uh, claim Abraham as their father, which is true, but he is a child of, Isaac is a child of promise. And God loves the Arab people, and God is reaching out to the Arab people like he's never reached out before. It's exciting to hear what's going on behind the curtain over there, how God is. I've told you before from my missionaries <clears throat> that are in, in Afghanistan and, and Saudi Arabia and other places all around the world, how God is sharing visions with these people, visions with women and men, and how they're seeing a vision of Isa, which is in the Quran, uh, which... Uh, is Jesus and how they're coming to faith in Jesus Christ. It's, it's incredible. But anyway, how Abraham had been faithless all some places along the way until chapter 22. Chapter 22, when he's willing to go up to the mount and offer his son, his only son, Isaac. Can you see the faith walk, the faith journey that it took to get to that point? Yeah, it took a lot, but he'd been through a lot. Well, Paul the apostle been through a lot too. I think back to John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11. If you remember in John chapter 1, when, G, when John sees Jesus walking to him, towards him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, you know? And he said the Spirit told him that when he sees the, the Spirit that came down like a dove, it says, descended upon him and as the Holy Spirit, he said, The one you see this dove-like descend upon he is the son of God. And he testifies in verse 34 of John chapter 1. He said, and John says, and I testify that this is the son of God. 
I testified with my own lips. This is the Son of God. Matthew chapter 11, a little different. He's in prison, and they're talking about whacking his head off because he been had a big mouth. <laughs> And he's going to chop his head off. And so he's questioning. And he gets his disciples. He says, his disciples, he says, hey, go ask Jesus if you're the one. Or do we expect another? What? John. John, John, John. Dude, dude, dude. Remember? Remember, you saw him. You testified with your own lips that this is the son of God. Yeah, Bob, things have changed a little bit since then, okay? Uh, I'm in a storm right now. And it's not looking good for the home team. So all of a sudden, John... John was kind of questioning everything that he once believed, that he thought was true, and all these things. Have you been there before? Have you been there before? If you haven't been there before, you're going to be there. I've been there at least. I hope you're not there. I hope you got greater faith than I ever had. But I've been there before. I've been there before just like the disciples when they were on the boat in Mark chapter 4. They were aggravated. You don't think they were aggravated? Jesus, don't you care that we're dying over here? Have you been aggravated with God? I've been aggravated with God. Have you been disappointed with God? I've been disappointed with God. Not understanding what God was allowing me to go through because I was in the midst of the storm. The clouds and the winds and the waves, they were beating the nonsense out of me. But then as I look backwards, I say, oh, Lord, I had no idea what you were doing. I had no idea how you were doing things. So Acts chapter 27, here's the background. Acts 27, actually... Acts uh, 26, <clears throat> verse 32 says, and, and Agrippa said to Festus that this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. You see, Paul the apostle had been used of God greatly to talk to King Agrippa in verse, ni- uh, verse 19 of Acts chapter 26 and, and also Festus, some really important dignitaries. But Paul the apostle felt a, um, the need to appeal to Caesar and so to Caesar, he would go. But I can tell you something, that, that Satan did not want him to be there, to go to Caesar, let me tell you. It tells us in this passage of Scripture in Acts 27, as you read it, you'll find out in verse 37 that there was also 276 other persons or prisoners that were with Paul the Apostle there on the way to Rome. And Paul tells the people on the boat there as they're going in verses 9 through 11 that it wasn't a good idea for them to go. It says, uh, verse 9 of Acts chapter 27, Acts 27, verse 9, then when much time had been spent, the sailing was dangerous because the fast was already over. And Paul advised them, saying, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Paul the apostle knew by the Spirit of God. Verse 11, nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things that Paul spoke. Can you imagine the centurion and the the boat captain come up to him and says, uh, what'd you say? Don't sail. What do you do for a living? A tent maker. Get to the back of the boat, okay? Shut up. Who do you think you are? Don't be telling me what to do. But he was right. We're going to pick up the story how Satan did not want Paul the Apostle to stand before Caesar and give his testimony. Would you? Paul the Apostle will stand one day before Caesar and give a, his testimony of the life-changing power of a risen Christ. Paul the Apostle has said in 2, T- 2 Timothy chapter 4, at my first offense, no one stood with me, but God stood with me. Oh, could you see? Could you? Oh, would I love to be a fly on the wall when Paul the Apostle was before Caesar and he's recounting his life on the road to Damascus and what God, the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, had done in his life. Unbelievable. Chapter 27, verse 6, 17 through 26, as I hurry. Hang with me. Acts 27, verse 17 through 26. Now, this is a story. And when they had taken it on board, it's talking about this... uh, uh, little boat they had, the skiff, in verse 16. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, and fearing lest they should run aground uh, on the sands, they they struck sail, and it was driven. They were in this tremendous storm. Uh, uh, It was a, a, a... huge storm out there. And so the ship was coming apart, so they, they put cables underneath the ship and tried to bound it together. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. They started throwing stuff out. 
Now on the third day, we threw out the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now, verse 20 says, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days now, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after a long abstinence from food, then Paul stood up in the midst of them all and said, men, you should have listened to me. Nobody likes to know it all, don't they? (laughs) You should have listened to me, he said, and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disastrous loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, of whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and indeed, God has granted you, graciously granted to you, all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe God, that it will be just as he told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. And when the 14th night had come, 14 days they were in the storm, 14 days, no wonder they felt like all hope was being lost. You see, Luke tells us in verse 20, Luke tells us that all hope was lost. They had given up. (laughs) Have you ever felt like giving up? I have. Have you ever felt lost? I have. Have you ever given up all hope? Yeah, like I say, I have. Until I got a word from the Lord. And so after this word from the Lord through the angel, Paul stands up in verse 21. And now I want you to put yourself on this boat. In this situation, the boat's literally coming apart. They got wires and they're trying to hold the boat together. I mean, it's creaking and the winds are blowing and the winds, the waves are falling. People haven't eaten and I mean, it's just not good at all. And again, all hope was lost up to this point. But in verse 21, what does it say? Paul starts to stand up in front of everybody. Can you see him? The five senses didn't make any difference anymore. The wind and the waves didn't make any sense anymore. His emotions didn't make any sense anymore to, to, the, to the world. He, he just, his faith took over. Paul said, Paul now said, must, uh, <clears throat> Paul must have appeared to everyone else like he had lost his mind. The wind and the waves were still beating his ship. The sky was still dark and the ship was still creaking like it was coming apart. But Paul was not moved by his five senses, by his emotions. The fear that once had gripped him melted away, and faith now overcame his fear. Faith now overcame his fear. And please don't miss verses 23 and 24. It says, For there stood by me this night an angel of the God, an angel of the God to whom I belong and to whom I serve. Don't miss that. The angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. Paul was a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And we belong to God. You are God's personal, precious possession. You got little kids. How much do you love your baby? With all your heart? Would you give your life? Absolutely, would you? Would you protect them? Anything you could possibly? Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't mess with a woman that has a little baby. Amen? Madeline, don't mess with them. How about a mama bear? They say the most wicked, wicked animal out in the woods is a mama with her cubs. Don't be getting near with a cubs, boy, because you're going to be in trouble. Do you realize you belong to God? That you are his personal child, that he loves you with all his heart? And this is what Paul says. He said, that stood by me an angel of the God of whom I serve and who I belong to. And see, Paul's faith statement was in verse 25. He says, in light of the fact that this angel told me these things, I choose to believe what the Lord has told me, and I choose not to believe what I actually see and feel and understand by my emotions. I choose to believe God's word. I choose to believe what he told me. And so he tells him, therefore, in light of what I was told, take heart and be encouraged. For I believe God, I believe God, that it will be just as he has told me. In the midst of the storms of life, we must remember who we belong to. And we must remember his word that he has given us, that strengthens us and encourages us. Even when the storm seems to be raging and and nothing changes. Remember, nothing had changed in this whole scenario. I want you to understand that. The wind still came. the The waves were still blowing. Everything, nothing changed except Paul's perspective on the storm. Paul had a different attitude now because he chose by an act of his faith, to believe what God had said 
other than the, what he actually was experiencing in this present state. And his word he was given us. There is also something very important, yet once again a paradox, something very difficult to do when we're in the storm. And I'll close with this. Remember the two things the Lord told me to do when, when he gave me the verse as I fell off the ladder and the day after my dad died. <clears throat> I had been with my dad for a couple months on hospice, very difficult time. And so uh, the Lord said, uh, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you and praise me. Praise you? That was a tough one. Praise you? Praise you for this? But I said, Lord, I'm going to praise you anyway. I'm going to give you praise, but not because of my situation, not because of the storm. I'm going to praise you because you're worthy of praise. Because it's a sacrifice of praise. It doesn't matter what I go through. You're still worthy of my praise because you're the King of kings and you're the Lord of lords and you're the mighty God. You created all things. And I know somehow, some way that you will bring something good out of this, even though I can't see it. There's an old song. Remember a guy named Russ Taft? Boy, I'm really, I'm really dating myself now. Used to be with a group called the Imperials, Russ Taft. And he, he had a song he used to sing, and I'm going, to bear, I'm going to spare you. I'm not going to sing. How you like that, huh? <laughs> Where's George when I need him? But the song by Russ Taft was called Praise the Lord. And I'm, I'm going to close with these lyrics, okay? And some of you remember the song, and you can look it up. It says, when you're up against a struggle that shatters all your dreams... And your hopes have been cruelly crushed by Satan's manifested schemes. And you feel the urge within you to submit to earthly fear. Don't let your faith you are standing in seem to disappear. Praise the Lord. He will work through those who praise him. Praise the Lord for our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord for the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you that they will drop powerless behind you when you praise him. Now, Satan is a liar. Amen. Now, Satan is a liar, and he wants to make us think that we are paupers when he knows himself we're children of the king. So lift up the mighty shield of faith, for the battle must be won. We know that Jesus Christ has risen, so the work's already done. Praise the Lord. He will work through those who praise him. Praise the Lord, for our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord for the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you that they drop powerless behind you when you praise him, when you praise him. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very difficult to praise the Lord in the midst of the storm. But when you know who God is, you know that you belong to him. You know that he'll be able to work everything out for his glory and his honor as he's molding you and shaping you and me into his image and understand that he's worthy of praise no matter what then Satan gets a black eye. You give Satan a huge black eye. You don't think Job gave Satan a black eye? Man, he walloped him. He beat the nonsense out of him because in everything at the end, Paul, Job kept his integrity and refused to curse God. Ladies and gentlemen, I just pray that you pray with me. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. Lord, as we go through these storms of life in our study and as we continue next week, as we see how you, Lord Jesus, help Paul and Silas praise you in the midst of the prison and how you turn everything around for your glory, I pray that if someone's going through a storm right now, I pray that they will praise you. I pray that today that somehow, some way, they'll turn, turn on their favorite praise music and put that CD in or whatever and get alone with you and just praise you because you're worthy of our praises. And Lord, if they're in the midst of the storm and they can't see and the winds and the waves are beating against their ship, I pray, Lord Jesus, they will get a new vision of who you are. And Lord, either calm that storm or calm them. I pray, Lord Jesus, that the storm's ahead in 2022, Lord, and I do believe there are storms coming. I believe individual storms are coming in 22, and I definitely believe storms are coming into this nation before you return for us, Lord Jesus. And I know that you'll be with us, Lord Jesus, and every step of the way, you'll be faithful. In your name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a good day.